This is the first time he's going to use the machete and his plan is to chop off their heads and place them on their lawn as an ornament. All right, let's... Uh, oh, are you trying to rush me? Look oh, my God. Yes. Did you call me? No, I didn't. Let's uh, let's get on with it because apparently someone didn't sleep last night for nope, some reason. I didn't. <laughs> you know, I slept like a king. Good so. for you. Good for you. All right, we are getting started. So, but if you haven't heard the last two episodes, the... Dybbuk box and the old three leg story. Great. Be sure to check those out. I kind of want to do another story on Tuesday or whenever the next time we record an episode, another cursed object. Hey, Brittany. Type of story. What's up, Brittany? Sounds good. So I'm not going to like recap Richard Ramirez. I'm going to do a lot of that in this episode. Okay. But you kind of understand where we're at. We've done a few different stories on him already. We've done the one where he drew a pentagram and lipstick. Mm -hmm. We've done done the one where he cut out that woman's eyeballs. Yep. And the, and we've talked about his background, how he loves Satan, how he's influenced by the music. He's the Satanist killer. Yeah. And he's really inspired by Jack the Ripper. And in fact, at this point in the story, he thinks that he is the next Jack the Ripper. He doesn't think he's going to get caught because like Jack the Ripper, he also walks with Satan. So he goes to the same neighborhoods and commits robberies, rapes, and homicides while there's police presence, mm -hmm. which is so brazen. And a lot of the times the cops, they wouldn't think that. I mean, who would do that? Yeah. Like no one's ever done that. He'll show up a week later right down the street at another house. Crazy. And and cops are driving by and everything else like and he's in there murdering. That's so he is really thinking he's never going to get caught and that Satan is helping him stay off the map. But the thing is, unlike Jack the Ripper, all right. I don't know if because we don't know who Jack the Ripper is. Richard Ramirez is more of a spree killer than a serial killer. Like he is killing and he's not going to stop until he gets caught or he dies. Mm -hmm. So that's the difference. If he would have stopped after the first few ones, he may have never been caught. Yeah. You know, but he's not going to be a Jack the Ripper because Jack the Ripper, his story is you know, the mystery. Right. That's what makes that story yeah. compelling. Yeah. You know? Richard Ramirez cannot get caught. He walks with Satan. Officer John Stravos pulled Richard Ramirez over mm -hmm. after this guy, the Night Stalker, just left Eagle Rock. Let's uh, go to Google Earth and see Eagle Rock right quick. I want to see where that's at. Is this? Does he put the same? Have the same uh, sticker? Oh, the bumper sticker. Yeah. Yeah, I guess he does. Yeah, smart. You would think though they would like police would maybe start looking out for that if they made the connection, but I don't think they made a connection there. I mean, because I mean, who have you ever heard anyone do that before? No, but it's a good idea idea. Yeah, it's a great idea. I kind of want to get one just for the car, just in case. Actually, you know what's kind of funny? Yeah. Did I tell? I, I I think I told you guys this, so I, I'm sorry for repeating the story. Um, but my parents went to the Culinary Institute of America, abbreviation CIA. And so um, one time, my dad was driving his car. He had like a Cadillac or whatever, I don't know. And he was speeding. And I think a cop, a cop either drove by him or pulled him over. I can't remember exactly the story, but saw he was wearing a, you know, Navy hat that said CIA with white letters on it. They're like, have a nice day. Let, just let him go. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's crazy, man. So there you go. Maybe we should get a CIA hat and we'll be like, oh, yeah, Culinary Institute of America, like in case anyone's questioning it. And what's the deal with that, too? Like, can can you wear a jacket that says FBI on it? Well, it's it's not like, well, yeah, you it may say female body inspector. <laughs> I guess. Um, but I mean, would you get would you get in trouble for impersonating a law enforcement officer? It's not it wasn't impersonating. And so like it was it No, was, I get I get that is you know, that is different because that's the school name. But if I was to wear like a CIA jacket, I guess I could say it's Yeah, I would do the same thing. Like let's yeah. just get a CIA hat. You know you love your hats, it's one you leave in the car. Yeah. And like if a cop pulls you over, that's the hat you're wearing, maybe it'll help you. And I, if they ask, oh, are you in the CIA, then you could clarify. Oh, Culinary Institute. Yeah. I would just say I Pro can't. Pro tip. No, if they ask, I'd be like, I can't disclose that information. 
Well, they may ask for like your badge or whatever at that point or your identification, in which case you just pull out your driver's no, license. No, I'll just be like, uh, officer, I, I'm going to need to take your car. I've got a <laughs> CIA. Can I, get your, uh, <laughs> can I get your ID number, sir? All right, here we are. This is Eagle Rock. At this point on this part of the story where he gets stopped again, he gets stopped a lot. He is just leaving a crime scene, but he went kind of further north. He hops right on the interstate and a officer, John Stravos, pulls him over. And this is a motorcycle cop. Pulls him over on his motorcycle and this Toyota that the Night Stalker was in hasn't been reported yet as stolen. So maybe that was working for him. But honestly, it's starting to seem like, yeah, maybe there is some supernatural power helping him out here. He sees this Toyota, just ran a red light, just got on the freeway, driving like a bat out of hell. And and this officer gives chase. He puts on his lights. He thinks the car is going to run, but then it doesn't. The driver pulls to the side and the man driving is a Mexican with black hair. He asks for his license and registration. Uh, sorry, officer, I don't have it. My name is so-and-so, whatever alias he was using at the time. Mm -hmm. And the officer went back to his car, went back to his motorcycle to call it in to see if this guy you know, had any warrants or whatever. Officer Stavros returned to the driver and said, hey, you're not that guy killing people in their homes, are you? Oh, gosh. Why would you say that? <laughs> no way, man. When are you going to catch that motherfucker? We'll get him. Hope so. I got a wife, you know. Are you sure you're not him? Hey, man, it's not me. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Officer John Stavros, <laughs> what, were you disciplined for this? No. All right, he returns to his motorcycle. Oh, my God. And continues to call in the name. Obviously, there's no record. Now, at that point, Satan tells his... <laughs> Sydney... No way, man. Promise. Hope to die. <laughs> that's, what he says. that's what he says verbatim. He says, no way, man. I, I hope so. I got a wife, you know. I mean, that's what, that's what his words were because the cop recorded everything down because he knew right after. I'll tell you why. He was probably like, man. <laughs> <laughs> This cop goes back to his motorbike and he continues to call it in, realizes that this guy gave him a fake name and that the Toyota has just been reported stolen. So as he's walking back, Satan lets his minion know that, hey, you've been busted. You need to get out of here. So Ramirez gets out of the stolen Toyota. He right with his finger, he draws a pentagram on the hood of the Toyota. And, and he bolts. He jumps over a 10-foot fence. He's very cat-like. And the officer gave chase, but he didn't catch him. Inside of the car, though, was a black leather wallet. And this is going to be really important in how they finally identify him. In the wallet was, it was actually his wallet. With like his actual ID in it? Not his actual ID because he never carried that. But it had a piece of paper with several phone numbers on it. One of the numbers was for a dental practice of Dr. Peter Leung and with a few other contacts, Dr. Leung's office was contacted and he gave, he knew exactly who it was because even during all of these killing sprees and rapes, Richard Ramirez attended his appointments regularly at his dentist office. Wowza. Even though he had terrible teeth and the reason he was showing up to all his, all his appointments was because he had a, some sort of mouth tooth decay disease that could have been fatal after a while. Do you remember we were watching the Mick and he had that terrible tooth? Yeah, yeah, thing? yeah. Yeah. So it's the same thing. Richard Ramirez had terrible teeth. He never took care of them and they were really painful to him and it was, they were becoming infected. And so he had really bad breath and teeth. That's what everyone said. This is, this is his mold Ugh. of the teeth that Dr. Leung provided. So they had molded his teeth and everything because they were going to do surgery. That ain't cheap. Well, yeah, he's still in diamonds and stuff. But he actually was attending his appointments on time. <laughs> like crazy. <laughs> Yeah, that is pretty crazy, actually. So the name in Dr. Leung's records was Richard Minna, and later they linked that to Richard Monos, M-O-U-N-O-Z, Richard Manus Ramirez. So even though it was a fake name at, at the dentist office, they figured it out through their, you know, wow. the computer system or whatever. Kind of crazy, right? Yeah. 
But at this point, he couldn't be caught. So we talked about that, how he's evading these cops and the bumper stickers. and Are that you he sure walked- it ain't you? <laughs> and that he walked with Satan. We also have been talking about the Avia footprint, right? That Oh, yeah, one, sneakers. Yeah. One sneaker. Apparently, there were only six made of this exact sneaker. And let me show you the sneakers right quick. Those are the black avias. Mm. They were only six shipped to California and only one in 11 and a half. So he managed to buy the only pair that was rare, I guess. The only rare pair. It's crazy. I mean, he didn't know, but he was wearing all black. And I guess people just didn't like the black, you know, and most people wouldn't buy it. But so we talked a lot about that shoe and that shoe comes up a lot. July 7th, 1985, Andrix in East Arlight Street. And this is in Monterey Park. You remember he followed that, I uh, can't remember her name now. You, I think her name was you, the attorney that he followed home and then right on the street. She pulled off to Monterey Park. So he had already killed here and I'm going to go over another rape and homicide in Monterey Park just a few weeks before. So he is brazenly doing this. East Andrick Street is right here. July 7th, 1985, Andrix on East Arlight Street. He was cruising Glendale, Rosemead, and Arcadia, but he ended up in Monterey Park a little bit after 9 a.m. A delivery woman named Lorne Dempster, who had already seen him previous, mm-hmm. sees him again stalking, and he, she's going to be pivotal in identifying this guy. She passes by again, and she's like, oh, is this that same guy? He yells out, hey, what the fuck are you looking at, bitch? Now, I want to talk about the term bitch because he uses that word a lot, bitch. And that's actually one of his signatures. That's how they know it's him. Oh, So there's a lot of crime in L.A., even homicides. But if someone, and he leaves a witness, says that, you know, he before he raped me or whatever, he called me a bitch and he kept using this word bitch. That's a signature. Yep. You know, that's how they know, okay, this is probably the same guy. He walks straight into the front door of a Joyce Lucille Nelson. He gives a quick prayer to Satan and looks around. She has lived at this house since 1949 and alone for the last 21 years. She was looking forward to retiring soon and spending more time with her five grandchildren. Her son, Don, was so worried about this Night Stalker situation, Mm -hmm. as as everyone was. Mm -hmm. He pleaded with her to let him install bars on the window, but she said, hey, I've been here since 1949 and, quote, I will not be a prisoner in my own home. Her neighbors were also worried at this point, not just about her, but about their own selves. As you'll see, Richard Ramirez even breaks into a deputy house at random who was working on his case. He had no idea. Jesus. So even the detectives like Frank Salerno and all these detectives, Frank Salerno is the famous like the head guy, yeah. The head guy, he solved the Hillside Strangler case. I thought that name sounded familiar. Yeah, so even he was scared that this dude is going to break into his house. So they're all sleeping with revolvers. Anyway, all the neighbors, including hers, were scared that this dude was going to break into their house that... They did something that I've never seen before. We always see the same things, right? Gun sales increase, locks increase, home security systems increase, all this stuff like that. But there was something else too. Paint, house paint increased because maybe the killer didn't even recognize this. And I really doubt he did because he never mentioned it after the fact. And it was probably a subconscious thing. But the majority of the homes that he had been terrorizing were of a beige and yellow color. And people started realizing that it was just a fluke, but they started begin painting their homes green and blue so they wouldn't have that beige and yellow color because they were like, well, maybe he's targeting those. He's not, but... So maybe subconsciously he is. He, he It like sticks out to him. If yeah. It's like a yellow color, maybe. So now it's interesting if you buy a home in LA and you're in a neighborhood that is mostly the same color and then there's this one house that sticks out or one or two houses that stick out, you should ask if they painted their house in 1985 because 99% they did. That's crazy. Isn't it nuts? (laughs) 
<laughs> I mean, everyone was doing this. Like paint sales increased. That's that's wild. Yeah, everyone was. And this guy was terrorizing and terrorizing. And he was just not getting caught. He would go back to the same places over and over. Wow. Anyway, I'm I'm on the, uh, we're still in the Avia shoe print. And like I said, we're kind of recapping and also doing other stories. But anyway, he walks right into Joyce's home. And he, at this point, is getting really confident. So he pulls out his 22 automatic and put, puts it right to her head. And then he wakes her up. Wake up, bitch. From the Night Stalker by Philip Carlo, startled, her eyes bulging, said, Oh God, who are you? What do you want? She quickly figured out, though, who he was. He takes that pistol and slaps her over the face. Shut up, bitch, or I'll kill you, motherfucker. Where's the jewelry? Where's the money, bitch? Uh, Sydney <laughs> says, reminds me of Scary Terry from Rick and Morty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about that last night in the shower, actually. <laughs> Scary Terry. <laughs> That was good a, call. That was good really call. unique. I was thinking about that because we, I've been playing this game called Dead Space, right? Yeah. And there's these monsters and they're all ugly and grotesque and they're, you know, bad guys. But to them, you know, all right. <sighs> I don't know how I'm going to say this, but like you have this whole thing of monsters. You know, some of them have to be hot or sexy to other monsters. You know what I'm saying? This is an interesting thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I think... I think you need to tone it down on the monster games. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like to them, like... Uh, someone's attractive? Well, not just that, but I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Fuck, I don't know. <laughs> mm, okay, sure. So, Which ones did you find hot? <laughs> At this point, she knows what's coming. He slaps her on the face and then... He dragged her to the bedroom by the hair and beat her to death kicking her in the face so hard that she spun around the floor. He left a clear imprint of the avia shoe embedded in her face. When Frank Salerno gets to each crime scene, that's the first thing he's looking for. Is this our guy? That's there's crazy. a dead body. Is there an avia footprint? Well, there's one embedded on her face permanently. That waffle-shaped pattern is embedded on her face. This is what that footprint looks like. Wow. It's, it's very, got a unique waffle waffle pattern, I guess. But that print was embedded right on her face. Nuts, right? Yeah. I mean, that's how they knew that he was here. That's that's fucked up. Dale Nelson, the son, says, my mom, you know, she would have been retiring just about this time and really starting to enjoy life. She was brutally murdered by Richard Ramirez. And it is really the pits. I mean, he has no, you know, emotion whatsoever about killing all these people, including my mother. Don Nelson, the other son, said he told the jury that Richard Ramirez murdered my mother three times. He beat my mother in the head with mm. a heavy metal object. The same beating caused my mother to lose blood, blood that my brother and I had to clean up. People wonder when someone dies, who cleans up the mess? It is the family, the survivors. Speaking of survivors, we know he's left survivors before. Right. So April 14th, 1985, 1586 Trumbrower Street. Let's go there. Okay. This is in Monterey Park, right? Right down the road from the other one. Oh my God, did you see that? Check this out. This is how close this is. Okay, the one we just went to is East Andrick Street right there. Uh-huh. And now we're going to 1586 Trumbauer Street. That's close. Like what, four blocks away? Yeah, that's super close. Super close. Crazy that he's doing this right after. April 14th, 1985, two weeks and four days after the Zazara murders. That was the one with the eye. He pulled out the eye. Yep. A 911 call comes in. It was 5.04 a.m. Monterey dispatcher Darlene Bosi gets a call and all it says is, help me, help me. And then it hangs up. Fire Captain Norman Case was first to arrive. He runs through the open door and he sees a, a man, Bill, the one who had called 911. He had slipped unconscious. Now, at this point, it is just the EMTs that get there. They have no idea there's been a break-in because all the 911 call said was, help me. Maybe this guy's having a heart attack. Nobody knows. And it's yeah. dark inside. There was no, no lights or anything mm -hmm. on. So the EMTs rush in. Bill was sitting on 
on the easy chair, unconscious, barely breathing. The room was dark. The EMTs rush back. They get the all their supplies. They get CPR gear and they clear the floor. And they realize, wow, is this guy a hoarder? Because it looks like there's stuff everywhere, like a tornado went through here. It's actually because they were just ransacked an hour before. They have to clear a path. An elderly female in a nightgown is standing in the hall. She is incoherent and her thumb was badly bleeding. She appears to be in shock, but she's still alive. Lillian, that was her name, was always this way ever since at least three years ago when she had that stroke and it impaired her speech patterns Mm. pretty badly. At this point, they're still thinking that this man who called 911 has had a heart attack. They see Lillian's wheelchair. They think, okay, she's just an invalid. You know, that's why she's not talking or whatever. They're treating this guy for a heart attack. Monterey Park Officer Michael Gorajewski arrives. He also enters the home thinking that this could be a heart attack, but then he sees Lillian. Her face was swollen and she was also wearing thumb cuffs, which are like little, they're tiny handcuffs. You can get them like at novelty shops and stuff. It's just the same, but you've seen some criminals have to wear them. Like they'll put the thumb cuffs on that link their thumbs together and then they'll have handcuffs on. Oh, interesting. Let me me show you a picture because I don't think you know what I'm talking about. I was thinking, um, what was it called? It was called a a finger trap, right? A Chinese finger trap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that is not it. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I was thinking of. And I was like, Huh, that feels like it's not going to work. No. That, <laughs> okay, yeah, I do need to show you then because that is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So this is basically what thumb cuffs are right here, you know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they use them for really violent criminals, but they'll put thumb cuffs and handcuffs on them. I guess for Richard Ramirez's sake, thumb cuffs are easy to transport. You know what I'm saying? And he can carry them with him. At this point, Monterey Park Officer Michael Gord Juski arrives and he sees the thumb cuffs. He immediately knew what this was. He cordons off the crime scene and he starts protecting evidence. He noticed that the screen was moved, removed from the bathroom mirror. When Lillian finally spoke, she said a quote, tall man in black with a gun and bad teeth did this. And here was her story. Bill Doy was the guy who called. He is an Asian American along with his wife. That's why they're living in Monterey Park. Mm -hmm. As I said before, Monterey Park is mostly uh, Asian, has a mostly Asian population. Mm -hmm. 66 married to the 56-year-old Lillian. She's an invalid. He's retired recently from his sales job. He just put down money on a brand new Ford van and they both were excited to travel the country together. He He is literally weeks away from living out his dream, traveling the country with his wife. He is a Japanese man who is a very decorated soldier in the U.S. Army during World War II. Mm -hmm. He fought for the U.S. Army, the 44th Regimental Combat Team. A little bit how this works. I don't know if I guess you know this, but during World War II, we we put all the Japanese Americans in camps, Mm -hmm. not concentration camps, internment camps, internment camps. Yeah. And he was one that said, hey, I want to fight for the call since I've you know, been living here anyway. So, and, and he fought with distinction. Hmm. Anyway, wow. at this point, they had no idea that someone had entered their home. They were sleeping. And Richard Ramirez will say this about how to sneak in a house like this and not wake anyone up. Oh, it takes years to learn how to still cover, to use the cover of night. It's not easy. You have to practice it. And you need someone who knows what they're doing to teach you. You've got to be aware of everything at once. And you always have to be careful about making noise. You've got to learn to move without noise. He cuts a screen from the house from an unlocked window and he says a prayer. Satan, this, what I, your humble servant, am about to do, I do for you. He walks past Lillian's room and sees the wheelchair. He knows that she's an invalid, which pisses him off because he wants young girls. He wants another Whitney Bennett. He doesn't, a 16-year-old, he doesn't want all these old women, but he's doing homes at random, so that's why he keeps finding himself here. He goes to the bedroom of Bill, raises his 
versus 22 and chambered it. But that cold metallic click of that semi-automatic pistol wakes him up because he has, you know, he has fought the Nazis for crying out loud. He's very vigilant. He immediately goes and grabs his gun from the nightstand. And he doesn't know that this is the Night Stalker or who it is, but he's going to shoot whoever it is. He's about to lift it up and point it at Richard. Richard sees this, that he's reaching and pulling that gun up, and Richard takes the first shot. The bullet hits Bill right above the upper lip and through his tongue. He began, would you think he was going to kill Richard Ramirez? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, go Bill, go Bill. Do it, do it. Or at least hurt him, you know, get yeah. get the first shot. Ugh. He began choking to death on the bullet because it became lodged in his throat. I told you he likes to use those 22 calibers, those small calibers, the ones that don't exit. Mm -hmm. And that's why. The path that the bullet had taken, tumbling after it had entered, had caused severe damage to his tongue, voice box, and brain. He couldn't pick up his 9 millimeter and pull the trigger. He tried to beg for his life, but could not articulate his words. Blood gushed from his mouth. Lillian awoke in the other room. From what I saw, they were sleeping in different rooms. I guess older couples It's not do uncommon, that. yeah. Like, I feel like your grandparents might do that. or not. My grandparents did do that. Yeah, yeah, it was like a thing. It wasn't separate bedrooms, but I know that they had separate beds. I kind of wonder if it's because they made smaller beds back then. They didn't make big beds. No, they did. My grand... My oh. <laughs> my... <laughs> this is gonna make you laugh. My uh, my Pepe, like I mean, he he had I think Alzheimer's towards the end, but he would make jokes. He was like, "Yeah, we had to eventually sleep in separate beds because we had so many kids." <laughs> like, yeah. Oh my god! He was like, couldn't keep her off me. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Yeah, he, they had six kids. My dad, I think, is one Jesus of six. One Christ. of six, I think. Six kids. Lillian wakes up in the other room, and she's now listening in pure horror. The man that she has loved for the last 40 years is taking his last dying breaths. So he's going to live on a little bit because he's the one that made the 911 calls. Mm. Bill fell completely to the floor, and then the killer, Richard Ramirez, started beating him until he was unconscious. He then goes into the other room. Shut up, bitch! Slaps Lillian, the invalid who can't speak anyway, mm. with the 22. Where's the jewelry? Where's the money? Shut up or I'll kill you, bitch! He said, even if she wanted to scream, she couldn't. Since the stroke, verbal articulation had been difficult. Richard began ransacking the home, and then he heard Bill come to in the other room, moaning in pain, and he goes back in there and beats him unconscious yet again. He then goes back to Lillian's room and rapes her violently. And this is what's sick about, mm -hmm. really sick about this story. As he's finished, he kisses her, force kisses her. Then he grabs a pillowcase, throws in some items and walks out. Bill was taken to the ER. Dr. Anthony Reed, a cardiologist, received him and noticed that all of Bill's vital signs had ceased. No blood pressure, no spontaneous respiration, no cardiac activity. He was he was pronounced dead at 5.29 a.m. Mm, so sad. So, but he left a witness. On July 20th, 1985, he began thinking... He began thinking of himself as a modern day Jack the Ripper, and he started seeing his name, or at least the Night Stalker name, in the newspapers. And he was wondering what people a hundred years from now would think. And he wanted to ensure that that legacy. But to do that, he knows he knew that he had to step it up a little uh -huh. bit. Uh-huh. So he began to work on his brand image, as you tech people would say. He wanted to scale up the violence. So on the 20th of July, 1985. From Philip Carlo, it was now that he made up his mind to take what he was doing to a new level, one that would shock and horrify the world in a way never known before. He wanted everyone to know of his power. He casually went into a downtown knife store, Ross Cutlery, and bought an industrial machete. Now, this is the story that we're focusing on tonight. So up until now, I know it's been fast paced, hasn't it? Boom, boom, boom. But this is the story I wanted to focus on because I believe this, this is when he consciously said, I need to be more violent 
for my image. And I, I, that's a first. Not necessarily for Satan. Not just for Satan, yeah. And I also think this is the, I mean, maybe in his mind, well, I'm not doing it for Satan anymore. I'm kind of doing it for myself. So maybe the start of his downfall. He would always say, as long as you have evil in your heart, you'll never get caught. So as long as he stayed evil, he He could, lost it. He, he got vain. Evil and vanity are not necessarily the same. <laughs> So I wanted to do this story because I feel like it's very important for this story. There's been a lot he's done. Yeah. But a lot of them, the MO is the same or whatever. And not to downplay any of them, but I feel like this one is a big step for him because he is not going to stop. LA's hot right now looking for him. Oh, yeah. Cops are everywhere. and. All he's got to do is leave town and, and but he I mean, doesn't. he's like staying in the same few neighborhoods. I too. know it's nuts, right? Yeah. I mean, he's he got stopped by the cop. When are you when are you gonna catch this motherfucker? You know? Yeah. Crazy. That was crazy. So this is the story I want to focus on tonight. July 20th, 1985. He began thinking of his brand image, what it would look like a hundred years from now. He didn't think he would be caught as long as he stayed evil in his heart, just like Jack the Ripper, but he wanted people a hundred years from now to look look at the Night Stalker name and have a very brutal story for all the podcasters a hundred years from now to tell a brutal story, you know? And so he goes into the local knife shop and buys an industrial machete. His next move he decided would be to leave the heads of the victims on the lawn as ornaments. That's what he's going. That's where he's going to tonight. Another stolen Toyota. He cruises into Glendale. Unfortunately, all the windows were locked in this house that he stopped at because the night stalker is in town and everyone's painting their houses and putting bars on their windows and locking up their all their windows and everything else. He is seeing it more and more as he'll continue to break in homes. He gets more frustrated. Everything locked, you know? When he first started, he could just walk in the front door. Yeah. And now it's like, shit, I, what am I supposed to do? Climb through the damn chimney? He was forced to cut the screen off of a French door and put his hand in there and unlock it. But he didn't enter the house. Instead, he went back to the car for the machete, walking quickly, all his senses sharper and more defined. He retrieved the large blade and returned to the yard, keeping his hand down, the machete hidden in the fog, which swirled around his legs as he moved. Before he entered the house, he knelt on the ground and prayed to Satan. By all that is evil, I, your humble servant, invoke Satan to be here and accept this offering. But was he doing it for Satan or was it for himself? This is the first time he's going to use the machete and his plan is to chop off their heads and place them on their lawn as an ornament, as some oh, kind of whoa. weird, you know, sacrifice. Almost like a Black Dahlia situation, you know? Yeah. Anyway, Max and Leah needing this couple right here. Another elderly couple, 68, 66 years old. This one's really sad. Max and Leah, 68 and 66 respectively, high school sweethearts. Their first time was with each other, and now they're almost 70 years old from high school. That's a long time. I mean, I, I don't know, man. My sister and Omar have been together yeah. for that amount of time. I mean, they're not old, but... Could you imagine putting out with me for... Well, that's like kind of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> they had known one another for 50 years and were as much in love today as they'd been when they first met. What he did next, Richard Ramirez does next, I believe this event shows how truly psychopathic, self-serving, and filled with hate this dude is. And then I, when I wrote that in my notes, like, okay, I want to say this, that he's self-serving and filled with hate. Then I also wrote a note that said he would probably want that to be said about him. Because that's the type of person he is, mm -hmm. which is like crazy. Yeah. Anyway, he's waiting in the doorway for about five minutes. He wants this event to be epic. He wants people 100 years from now to remember how this went down exactly because he wanted to be idolized like Jack the Ripper. So he stands there and stares at this couple snoozing away and they are just completely out like nothing's going to happen. It's dark in the room. This shows you how much fun it is for him. He, his left hand scales the wall. He's looking for that light switch. The right hand is holding this machete. You know what a machete, a big machete is, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. As soon as his fingers, his left hand touch that plastic light switch that is flipped down, he 
flicks it up into the up position, which means what? He's not, before he's going straight to their head and pulling the trigger while they're sleeping. Remember the first stories we talked about? Now what's he doing? He's got a, a big machete and he's turning the light on. He wants them to wake up. What? Like, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, he wants them to wake up, which is, it just blew my mind when I saw that. According to scientists, it takes anywhere from 10 milliseconds if you're in a light sleep to hundreds of milliseconds in a deep REM sleep. I was trying to figure out how much time it took them to register that someone turned on the lights and was standing in their doorway with a machete. Now, regardless of the time it took, Max was the first to lift his head as his executioner started staring him down with those dark, evil eyes that he has. Staring him down with this machete. Then he kicks the bed. Kick the bed. The lights are on. Kicks the bed. Reminds me of boot camp. Like, turn the lights on and get everyone up. They used to throw the trash can. Yeah, they would take the trash can full of trash and sling it across the freaking barracks floor. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, kicks the bed. The lights are on. He wanted Max to sit up. Because what, what do you do? You sit up. And when you sit up, you create this perfect silhouette for a guy with a machete. Because he wants to do a clean cut. He also wanted them to see it. Because at this point, all the rest of his murders, he's going to be hysterically laughing. Like he's having a good day at work. <laughs> like he's, you know, doing whatever. Cutting down a tree or something. Or some bushes like at work as a landscaper laughing. Richard kicks the bed. The lights are on. Max is the first to set up. Quote, Max bolted up, not believing his eyes. Shocked, startled, seeing death as clearly as an oncoming train. Leela screamed. The maniac, laughing hysterically, yelled, Rise and shine, motherfuckers! Fucking nuts, right? Mm -hmm. Rise and shine, motherfuckers. He then brings down that machete on the left side of Max's neck. What the fuck? He kicks the bed. Rise and shine, motherfuckers. He has the machete up. He says that. Rise and shine, motherfuckers. What the, what are we, what is this guy, man? Is that not insane? Yeah, he's crazy. Yeah. Straight up crazy. Now he wanted that neck to come clean off. But like Jack the Ripper, Remember Jack the Ripper had problems getting the head off. Yeah. That head didn't come off. The machete wasn't sharp enough. Or maybe that's just not the right tool to have. Either way, he got half the neck off. And then he pulls out that 22 from his waistband and cracks him right in the forehead. Shoots him right in the forehead with it at close range. Leela at this point is screaming. She just saw her high school sweetheart mm -mm. for the last 50 something years. Almost get his head chopped off and now shot in the forehead. She starts crying and begging for her life. I also found it ironic that Max is a respected deacon at the Glendale Church. I kind of feel there may have been some energies there, you know? Yeah. Like with Satan and Jesus or, you know, the Holy Spirit or whatever, because he's such a religious man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I don't know. Leela is now screaming, begging for a life. He pulls the trigger in her face three separate times, shoots her dead three bullets right in her face. He gets on the interstate. He goes, no, within 30 seconds, he's on the interstate. He goes directly to his fence's house, the guy he sells the jewelry from. Now, after this, the fence, he's a criminal too, but he's starting to suspect this is the, this may be the night stalker. He's just beginning to suspect. He's kind of suspected before, but what's he going to do? Go to the police? He's also breaking the law. All, but even this guy has a conscience. He said after that, after this one, he's no longer accepting any more jewelry because he's tired of this man bringing jewelry back with blood still on it. He doesn't even wipe it off. He sells it to this guy with the victim's blood on it. Jesus. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. Yeah. Gross. So the machete didn't want, didn't work like he wanted. Now we're going to end there, but the next episode we're going to talk about the final, it'll be a final one. I'm done with this guy. Like, so I, I feel like we, we know who this guy is and yes. everything. Okay. So we're just going to do one more, be quick, how he gets caught and then go through his love life, his marriage. <laughs> He married in prison. Oh, oh. Yeah. I was like... Yeah, he married a virgin. That's right. I forgot you told me And that. she said if he got, if he gets executed, she's going to kill herself. She, he died of natural causes. <laughs> I mean, 
Well, I am interested to hear how the story concludes. Yeah. Well, well, thanks guys for joining. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I know it was a little different. Um, yeah. So I guess Jim will be back here next weekend. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> assuming no surprises. Yes. Should be fine. Sweet. Well, thank you so much for being here. And until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people. I kind of run this shit.